Hello, thank you. Uh, hello and welcome. Thank you all for taking some time off from your busy exam preparations uh, to spend your time here with us. This is the second lunch seminar uh, hosted by uh, the Life Sciences at the University of Oslo. My name is uh, Jan Klepp Mjelva, and I am going to try to guide us through this uh, proceedings today to the best of my ability. Just a brief introduction. Uh, I am a student here at the University of Oslo. I have a bachelor's degree in physics, and I'm currently doing my master's in philosophy. So I'm quite into this cross-disciplinary work that um, the life sciences are all about. Uh, more relevant for me being here today, however, is that I'm currently the leader of Kulturutvalget, which is a student group uh, hosting debates and lectures at Chateauneuf. Well, now on to the agenda. Today's topic is the adaptive brain. And we will soon hear three 10 minute lectures covering uh, different aspects of this topic. After we are done with the three lectures, we have allotted some time uh, for questions or a qu short QA. It will not be an a opportunity to ask questions during the lectures. So if you have a question for the first lecture or something like that, it might be clever to just note it down so you won't forget it. Uh, this whole debacle is supposed to last 45 minutes, and so we hope to be done by one o'clock. Before we go on to the good stuff, however, I would like you all to give a warm hand to Professor Jan Bjorli, head of the Institute of Basic Medical Sciences, and today representing the Life Science Board. He has agreed to say a few words before we start. So, a few words of introduction to today's uh, seminar on topics such as uh, brain and cognition, memory, and uh, various uh, underlying reasons for Alzheimer's disease. So, um, neuroscience nowadays, a field whose time has come. It's existed for a long time, but it has growing importance and relevance. There are many large-scale brain initiatives around the world in the United States, so-called brain initiative the Human Brain Project in the EU, there are similar initiatives in Japan and China, and there is a strong political and societal demand for treatment for brain diseases. The costs of these diseases are enormous, so is the suffering. The neuroscience field is a very multi-omic field. It consists of many layers of investigations, from the smallest to the whole brain and the, the full behavior of the human. And it, in each layer, I, there are so many techniques and dimensions that it's hardly possible to imagine and think, how can you combine all of this? So here we have subcellular resolution and a number of methods introduced. We go to the cellular level, to the whole tissue and organ, and the whole brain. And to, at all these levels, there are different techniques of, uh, used uh, to study the brain and to understand the brain and learn about also its diseases. Today we are going to see some examples that uh, maybe starts in a few of these boxes and spreads out a little bit. And of course, the science today will really have to go across many of these levels in order to understand important questions. So at the spatial scale, we go from uh, picometers, genes, proteins, up to centimeters, the whole brain. At the temporal scale, we go from picoseconds and molecular dynamics at the bottom up to years and development and aging. This is difficult. Just so are these preachers and scholars holding various views blind and unseeing. In their ignorance, they are by nature quarrelsome, wrangling, and disputatious, each maintaining reality is thus and thus. This is an old writing. It applies to many disciplines, and it applies to neuroscience today as well. The blind men looking at different parts of the elephant, and they describe each their own part, what is the whole, what is the full meaning. We're still really working uh, on this aspect. Neuroscience is truly interdisciplinary, requires a lot of different competences. It also reaches into informatics, for example. So you have to integrate all this in order to really understand the brain as well. With these words, welcome to the three speakers. I'm sure they will help you get an insight into this. Yeah. Um, the first lecture today is uh, by Professor Christine Ballhoved. 
Christine Wallholt is a professor of uh, cognitive neuropsychology at the Department of Psychology, and she's also the co-founder of the research group Lifespan Changes of Brain and Cognition. This summer, LCBC was named a world-class research group by the University of Oslo, and together with her husband, she received the University of Oslo's research prize in 2015. Uh, she turned 39 yesterday, uh, so now we are quite uh, excited to hear whether here and maybe you also see whether age affects brain and cognition. A big applause to Christiane Wallowood. Thank you. Thank you very much for the <coughs> kind introduction. Um, I'm very happy to be here. As you said, I um, um, turned 39 yesterday, and that was actually also the date that I was first asked to give this presentation, so therefore the topic, does age itself affect brain and cognition? So age in years, of course, it's just an expression of how many times you've been circling around the sun. And as we circle, our brains, they grow and they decline. And right now, in my brain, probably just both positive and negative stuff is going on simultaneously. There is the making and losing of neural connections and their insulation and so forth. And so we tend to speak about age effects on brain and cognition. And by cognition, I mean our ability to uh, attend and remember and reason and so forth. So all of this changes all the time with age. And, and, but what is it really that makes it happen? Um, and in my research group, we study changes in brain and cognition throughout the lifespan. Uh, and so as you see, there are numerous good people behind the work that I'm gonna present here today. So it's not just me. What we do to study the brain is that we have uh, MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, giving us these very detailed images of the brain at multiple time points. And some age differences are just visible to the naked eye. So uh, this, these participants here, they're both very healthy, uh, but the 74-year-old uh, has somewhat wider ventricles, somewhat wider sulci than this 33-year-old. Uh, and when we want to track these changes in the brain across time, and we want to relate them to cognition, we need to quantify them somehow. And we also then have measures of white matter microstructure, and we have measures of cortical thickness. And let's look at what happens with cortical thickness throughout life. Um, we see here the brain, and when it's becoming blue and purple, the cortex is becoming thinner. And this is from age 25 to 85, and you see this widespread thinning throughout the cortical mantle. So here is your forehead, here's the back of your head. Let's now just reverse the inner <coughs> part. And you can see that there are, is especially prominent thinning in the frontal lobes and the medial temporal lobes. And you see some of this pattern also. That. And now we're looking at the medial side of the brain, side in the frontal and temporal lobes uh, specifically. So what then happens to cognition looking at these brain changes? <coughs> well, we know that some capacities, such as world knowledge, vocabulary, and so forth, it tends to develop uh, for a long time and be very well maintained. Also, in <coughs> there we see another story. So older adults, they quite consistently do less well than the younger adults for all of these different higher age, you have age here on the x-axis, and so other uh, abilities, such as working memory, long-term memory, and speed of processing uh, capacities here, and this is virtually a linear function of age. So that begs the question, is aging programmed? Is aging of brain and cognition programmed? And some people indeed have suggested that yes, there is a program for aging. <coughs> it could be that we are programmed to deteriorate as a benefit to the species. Like in this quote here, suggesting that worn out individuals are not only valueless to the species, but they are even harmful, for they take the place of those which are sound. My wise man. Uh, so he's suggesting that we have some processes that actively drive biological deterioration. Well, it could be true. We could have this to prevent overcrowding, further evolution and so forth. It could be possible. Um, <coughs> but there are some problems inherent in this statement. So, um, first of all, um, in very many natural environments, uh, organisms do not go on to reach an old age. So, 
for instance, 80% of wild mice, they die before they turn one year of age, before any deterioration begin. So we would have scant opportunity to evolve any like genes for aging. And also we wouldn't really have the need to weed out any organisms. And also <coughs> I think there is some circularity in this very uh, argument in that it proposes that people are worn out when it's actually trying to explain why they are getting worn out. So rather, people like Thomas Kirkwood would say that, no, we don't really have any strict program for aging. Uh, it's more so that evolutionary considerations suggest that aging is caused not by active gene programming, but that evolved limitations in somatic maintenance so that we have a buildup of damage. There is wear and tear. We only have so much energy to possibly invest in the maintenance of the organism. And so there will be wear and tear, but we were not programmed to die, we were programmed to survive. And so let's look back at cognition and the brain. So is there anything to suggest this here? Well, these are data from more than a thousand individuals in our studies. And again, you have age here. And you can see that certainly there is an age effect, right? So you have a decline of white matter volume in this case, and you have a decline in visospatial reasoning with age. But equally apparent are the enormous individual differences. So whereas one 80-year-old does poorly, and other just does just as well as the best young adults. And the same for white matter, one has a very low volume, another above average for young adults. So this suggests that no, we don't really have a strict program for aging of brain and cognition. There are so many individual differences. And what then is it that drives uh, these uh, differences in aging? And we have one study <coughs> in our group where we study memory and we have different age group. One is uh, in their 20s and one is in their 70s. <coughs> and if you, when you look here, this is a task where they're asked to learn as many words as possible in a few minutes. And the people in their 20s, they learn on average about 20 words, but age here explains 40% of the variance so that the people in their 70s, they learn on average just about 10 words. They lose on average about two words per decade. It's quite dramatic. Uh, they remember half at the time they're 70, right? Um, but is this really an age effect? <laughs> we, have <laughs> we have a memory training project. So these uh, are my PhD students, me and Anna Cecilia. And what we did in this case, these are the same individuals, but now at time point two, at retest for both groups, the older group has been trained for 10 weeks with memory strategies. And now we see that age is no longer a significant predictor of memory. It explains less than 3% of the variance, and rather than losing two words per decade, they've now lost about half a word per decade. It's quite, it's quite amazing, I would say. So then, does age itself affect cognition? Maybe it is not only so. So this is one possible variable. And then, does, can you change your brain too by thinking differently? by this type of cognitive training, and even so in older age. Well, we've had another project testing that, and again, we see these performance gains with training, with green relative to blue for each of four participants. We saw a thickening of the cortices, and we saw an improvement in white matter quality in underlying areas. And this degree of improvement in white matter was related to the amount of cognitive benefit from training. It's quite impressive. And so, uh, also, in our samples, we ask our participants <laughs> about their physical activity, and we find that those who report more physical activity, they have lesser thinning across 3.5 years in the frontal lobes. On the other hand, higher BMI, body mass index, obesity, overweight, was related to more thinning, as was higher cholesterol in the blood, whereas more DHA, more fatty acids in the blood, more vitamin D was related to less thinning. And so we have this pattern where we don't, we can, my hope is that someday we can replace age in the equation to explain brain and cognition by a host of other variables. It's not about the amount of times you've been circling around the sun, but what you've been doing <laughs> while doing that. And so in conclusion, there is little evidence for a strict and general program for decline of brain and cognition. There are substantial individual differences, and these are affected by a host of factors, and we think that they do so through lifelong 
accumulation of impact, and that they are not specific to aging. So that means that you have a lifetime of possibilities. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you. Yeah, hang on. Uh, well, thank you, uh, thank you, Christina. Uh, on uh, behalf of the Jarlsbergs Bibliothek, uh, we would like to give you a thermos so that I, I've read. Uh, I think I've read a study that says that coffee is good for uh, for the brain as uh, well. So yes. Well, no coffee and <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, then next in line is uh, Torkel Hafting. He is an associate professor at the Institute of Basic Medical Sciences at the Faculty of Medicine. He received his PhD in physiology at the University of Oslo uh, and spent six years as a postdoc at uh, MTNU, Center for the Biology of Memory. It's now called the Kavli Institute for Systems Neuroscience. Together with, uh, with his wife, Marianne Fien, he discovered the grid cells and the brain's GPS system in uh, the laboratory of Edward and Maybrit Moser. Uh, these discoveries that led to the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine 2014. Today he is here to talk about storage of long-term memories, so let us all give him a big applause as well. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the nice introduction and uh, for inviting me here today. I think this picture by Edvard Munch is illustrating quite well uh, the topic I'm going to talk about, the long-term memories. And it's quite fascinating that memories can sustain throughout the whole life. <laughs> and uh, the molecular and cellular basis for these very long time memories are among the most central and also controversial questions in neuroscience today. So, how do we make memories? We have all this sensory information coming into the brain and we encode it and put it into some short-term storage and then we can either forget it and lose this information or we can consolidate it and put it into long-term storage. And when we have it here in the long-term storage, we may uh, remember it again. So we call this retrieval when we pick out the memories. So, what's actually happening in the brain when you form new memories? Here you see some uh, uh, brain cells, and they have these connections between them. And when we learn something, uh, these connections, these synapses are strengthened. And they may grow, or they just make changes in the electrical properties. And <coughs> Actually, this picture is uh, quite nice but, uh, and artistic, but a bit misleading. Because the brain, in the brain, it's densely packed with these neurons, and they have thousands of connections to each other, which we may represent more schematic like this. So, <coughs> memories, they are stored in networks of neurons with strong connections to each other. So, for example, if you think of your wedding, maybe it's these neurons that had some very strong connections to each other that represent this memory. While when you are going to pick up another uh, memory, it's other neurons with especially strong connections that contains this uh, memory. So, Terje Lømo at UIO, he made this uh, famous discovery in the 70s how the connection strength between neurons can change. And now we know that, we know in great detail uh, the molecular mechanisms, uh, how memory is formed. But how memories can sustain for decades remains a mystery. So, how can we preserve these strong connections? So we have been looking at some uh, proteins that actually are outside the neurons. So here you see a neuron uh, colored in red. And in green, we have a color on some extracellular molecules. 
they are very long-lasting, and they almost form a net around the neurons, and we call these perineural nets. And in every of these small, tiny holes, there is a synaptic connection. And these uh, molecules are known to stabilize the synapses. So we thought, oh, maybe these extracellular molecules also are those who stabilize memories. <coughs> so uh, we, cannot, uh, uh, we cannot look at a human brain to figure out this question. We need uh, animal experiments. <coughs> and fear memories are quickly established and long-lasting and well-studied studied in both humans and animals. And we used a method called classical Pavlian fear conditioning, where the animal learns to associate a light flash here with an unpleasant stimuli, a weak electrical uh, uh, shock to the paws. And later, if you just flash the light, the animal will remember this and show it by a very stereotypical posture. It's freezing, it's like standing totally still, because it remembers that the light was associated with this uh, unpleasant stimuli. And it has been well known for a long time that they can remember this uh, months later. So here is the graph telling how much of the time the animal spends standing still or freezing. So during habituation, when the animal is just walking around here, uh, it's maybe standing still like 5 to 10% of the time. And then when you test the memory after one month and you uh, flash the light, you see they remember they are standing still about 50% uh, of the time. So, but where are these memories stored? Uh, Forming these fair memories depend on subcortical structures like amygdala. And later, the memories are moved to the cortex for long-term storage. So we <coughs> wanted to look at these uh, uh, extracellular molecules in the cortex. And this is a section of the uh, rat brain, a coronal section. And in pink here, you see the area in the secondary visual cortex where we have removed these perineural nets. So, what happens now? Uh, if you break down these uh, molecules, will the animal uh, still remember the task? So, the, we train the animal and then uh, a couple of weeks later we remove these perineural nets and then we test the memory after 30 days. And this is uh, how the animals behave during the habituation uh, before. And then how the control animals remember the test. And then the interesting thing, uh, when we removed the perineural nets, these animals did not remember uh, it as good anymore. So these perineural nets, they are important for retrieval of remote memories. So what about learning and short-term memories? Is it so that it's just a general effect if you mess up with the brain breaking down these molecules? Uh, you get some effect on this learning task. Well, we want to look at these short-term memories and learning. So then we removed the net and did the training and then did the memory test just a couple of days later. And as you see here, uh, with the same graph, kind of graph, now there is no difference between the control animals and animals where we removed the nets. So <coughs> this effect that we have seen is specific for the retrieval of long-term memories. So, is this relevant for humans? If you just look at a human brain, and here a very big uh, rodent brain, 
They look very different. But actually, all mammalian brains have the same organization and the same brain areas are involved in fear, uh, conditioning, fear memories. And they also consist of the same kind of molecules and cell types and so on. And for example, these perineural nets has been shown to be uh, distorted in uh, mental disorders like schizophrenia. But that's another story. So I'll just sum up uh, that we need these intra intact extracellular matrix molecules for retrieval of remote memories. And uh, this is the Hafting Kühne group, which is a close collaboration with the Department of Biosciences and Institute of Basic Medical Sciences. And uh, uh, PhD student Elise Thompson has been doing most of these experiments together with Mattis and Christian Lönnsche. So thank you. <laughs> thank you to Tokil. And uh, you can have a thumbs as well. So um, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Um, last but not least, we have uh, Professor Inga Olsen. He is a professor emeritus at the dep Department of Oral Biology at the Faculty of Dentistry. He is now currently working on an EU-funded project that, uh, from a microbiological microbiolo perspective, explores the connections between inflammation in the gum and cardiovascular diseases, arthritis and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, maybe better known in Norwegian as COLS. He is uh, currently also establishing a broader connection, uh, co a collaboration within Alzheimer research. Based on some of his previous discoveries, Professor Olsen has the honor of having a genus of bacteria named after him, the Olsenella. He is here to present some of his findings for us, so please welcome Professor Inga Olsen. Thank you very much. I will uh, try to uh, answer the question, can oral infection be a risk factor for late onset Alzheimer's disease. This is the most common uh, infection in the oral cavity. It's called periodontitis. You can see here that uh, there are large amounts of um, uh, plaque, <laughs> as we call it. Uh, on, on the root surfaces, and this uh, plaque contains mainly of bacteria. You can see it here. Uh, this is what we try to brush every morning and evening. Uh, this patient hasn't been very successful, and we can see the inflammation of his gums we can see that this patient has lost two teeth, and this tooth is probably very loose. The prevalence of this uh, disease in its mild forms affect around 75% of adults in the US. Advanced forms, as we saw here, around 20 to 30%. Uh, and in Norway, eight to 10% of the population age 50 to 70 years, uh, have advanced periodontitis. That is around 100,000 people. This is a section through the gum. You can see the teeth, tooth here and the gum here. This is a healthy situation and this is periodontitis. What is noteworthy about periodontitis is that you have a large amount of plaque uh, approaching the root surface down here, and you should also realize that this plaque is in close connection with the uh, uh, tissue around it and with the vessels here. So there is easy access for the microorganisms in this plaque to come over to the vessels. This subgingival plaque, as we just saw, is uh, a reservoir for gram-negative bacteria. They are present in large amounts close to vessels, and the epithelial lining of the periodontal pocket often has ulcers 
through which the bacteria can penetrate. Gram negatives uh, release lipopolysaccharide and other toxins, which are potent, which are potent virulence factors. And these are carried into the tissues and blood vessels by small outer membrane vesicles. This shows the blood supply in the mouth and shows that it is very rich up towards the brain. So the organisms in the mouth have easily access to the brain. When organisms in the mouth come out into the bloodstream, we are talking about bacteremia. And every time you show on the tooth that is loose, or you brush your teeth, or you use uh, a toothpick, you get this bacteremia. In this study, uh, 410 blood samples from 149 persons contained as much as 119 different species belonging to 33 different genera. And even species rarely discovered in the mouth were detected. And 48 of the isolates represented new species which hadn't been described before. So you can see that the diversity of bacteria going from the mouth out into the circulation is very wide. We also see inflammatory mediators in the inflamed periodontium, the soft tissue around the teeth, and uh, they are also released to the bloodstream together with oral microorganisms and their products. So what about periodontal bacteria and AD? In 14 studies, oral spirochids were detected in human AD brains. Seven different oral spirochids were identified in 14 out of 16 AD brains. Spirochids, which were isolated, they produce biological and pathological hallmarks of AD, that is amyloid beta and neurofibular tangles, NFTs. After exposure of mammalian neuronal and glial cells in organotypic cultures. LPS from P. gingivalis, which is another key organism in periodontitis, had accessed human brains during life, while no LPS was detected in controls. In 2,355 people over 60, there were associations between PD and cognitive impairment and between antibodies to P. gingivalis and cognitive test performance. What could the possible consequences be to the brain of having this auto bacteria there? First of all, uh, sustained inflammation would be caused in the brain, which is another hallmark of AD. These spirochetes induce a latent and slowly progressing infection by evading host defense. They are therefore called stealth pathogens. They promote their survival and proliferation by blocking the complement cascade. And P. gingivalis has multiple lipid A structures, and that makes it difficult for the host to recognize this organism. What about other microorganisms? Could they be related to AD? Let's have a look at virus. Herpes simplex virus, including Epstein-Barr virus and cytomegalovirus, are found in high copy counts in aggressive periodontitis. HSV is present in more than 70% of the population over 50 years. It persists latently in peripheral uh, nerves and neurons and is periodically reactivated in neuroglia brain cells. HSV1 produces the main components of the amyloid beta plaques and NTFs and prevents their degradation. HSV is a strong risk factor for AD in the brains of patients with the APOE 
E4 allele. And the HSV IgM, which is a sign of reactivated infection, almost doubled the risk of AD in one study. What about yeast? With a growing population of elderly, systemic mycosis have increased dramatically over the last 30 years. Oral yeast can be found in periodontal pockets, root canals, on the oral mucosa, and particularly under dentures. Disseminated mycosis has been reported in AD patients. Fungal proteins and polysaccharide were detected in the peripheral blood serum of AD patients. Fungal proteins and DNA were also demonstrated by PCR in AD brains. Chitin-like fungal structures have also been found in AD brains. How do these oral microorganisms get to the brain? They get there, first of all, through the bloodstream. The permeability of the blood-brain barrier increases with age. Microbes, microbial products, and pro-inflammatory mediators can therefore cross the BBB. Also, APOE E4 reduces the integrity of BBB. Circumventricular organs and perivascular spaces are devoid of BBB. Olfactory and trigeminal nerves bypass BBB. So does also fila olfactoria and tractus olfactorius and olfactory cells carrying bacteria and thereby acting as Trojan horses. Are there other factors involved? Well, major risk factors for AD in the APOE allele, which also promotes, is, is the, the, the major risk factor for AD is the APOE allele, which also promotes infection and increases expression of inflammatory mediators. Cytokine-related genes may be involved in susceptibility to inflammation in both AD and PD. 20 different loci were found to increase the susceptibility to AD, including polymorphisms in genes associated with IL-1 and TNF-alpha. There could be an interplay between genetic risk factors and environmental factors in AD. Also, nutritional deficiencies are common in elderly and AD subjects and may cause gradual loss of nerve synapses. There is also clinical evidence for an association between PD and AD. This is demonstrated from clinical features of PD and antibodies to its pathogens in several cross-sectional and longitudinal studies. Neglect of oral hygiene promotes inflammation of the gums. Loss of teeth, which we see in periodontitis, is associated with poor memory. Commences on the loose may silently multiply in immunocompromised patients. So, to the conclusion, AD has a complex and multifactorial etiology. Oral infection may be a risk factor for AD, but it is not the only one. Thank you for your attention. How about afterwards? Um, we got some time for at least one question from the, uh, from the audience. So, if there's anyone. Hmm, no. Uh, well, uh, what I wonder, uh, wonder is, uh, does any of you lectures today have any questions uh, for each other? Yeah. Torkil? <laughs> I, I think uh, we, we can stay here a couple of minutes after the... Yeah. And uh, if people have questions, they can approach us. And I think that's, uh, that can be interesting. Yeah, well, well. yeah uh, Jan. 
maybe a, a brief question to essentially all of you, but perhaps uh, Folke will primarily. Uh, when you study some of those uh, special synapses and molecular phenomenons that you connect to memories, and you compare a little bit with my slide with all the levels, right, from the smallest to the biggest, <laughs> how, how many levels do you go across in your studies? Yeah, <laughs> yeah um, uh, so that's a good question. And uh, of course, we want to, uh, to make a bridge between as many of these levels as we can. And that study is, um, uh, in that study we we look at the behavior, which is like the uh, big level, and then we, uh, uh, we interact with these molecules at a quite low level. But the next step for that study will be to look more into the details and intermediate levels there in order to really understand what's going on. Yeah. Thank you. Any more questions from the audience? Well, doesn't seem like that. Shall we just uh, wrap it up then? Um, yeah, this is, um, well, I will remind you that this was the second seminar in a monthly series which will continue into next year. So mark your calendars for that. Uh, and uh, we would also like some feedback. You can see these bricks in the, in the back. Green is good, yellow is uh, OK, and uh, red is bad. So we see what tower, the tower becomes the greatest afterwards. Um, all that's left is to just thank, uh, give a thank you to Jan, Christine, Torkel, and Ingar for spending time with us today. And thank you to you, everyone who attended uh, today's seminar. Good luck with your exams and have a happy holiday. <laughs>